my name is Colleen Getty, and this is the Journey of a Story series for The Room to Write. And this is where we talk to different local authors and find out about how they write. So today we have Linda Malcolm, who's a nonfiction essay writer and published Cornfields to Codfish. So welcome, Linda. Thank you. It's wonderful to be here. We're so excited to talk to you. Yeah. I know you because you're in my critique group, and I've known you for some time, so this will be a fun talk. Mm -hmm. um, but we'll start with sort of helping the audience to picture what does it look like when you're writing? Like physically, uh, you know, do you have a some sort of schedule yeah. or? Yeah, I, I started writing about a decade ago. And I'm a mom with small children, so initially I carved out about three hours, one day a week for myself. And um, that has become ritual and habit that I rely on. So many of us aren't lucky enough to have a writer writing profession where we can spend days on end writing. So that was my way to kind of carve out space for me to write. Yeah. And I, I like to write in a very quiet space. I don't right in my house. I go to the library for those three hours. And um, I start off with a very specific setup. I set my computer up. I set a notebook up next to me. I set my water. I set the stage so that when I move to the typewriter, to the keyboard, I can just write. And that notebook I have near me is not for writing. It's for catching those thoughts that might interrupt my writing. Mm. Um, if I'm focusing on a, a paragraph and suddenly I think I didn't make that appointment, that notebook is there to catch that. And then I can just quickly shift back to what I'm really doing that day. I love that. That is awesome because so many, especially you know, moms or people that have various things going yeah. on, uh, it is when you're quiet finally that some of these things come in and then you're thinking, oh, I got to remember this. Yes. I think that's an awesome sort of dumping ground. <laughs> it is. Uh, and that's a great technique. Mm -hmm. And how did, did you always do that, or was that something you started to just come up with? It, it kind of, I felt the interruption. I don't like interruption when I'm writing. So actually, before that time starts, my writing time, I usually spend about an hour going through the calendar and just clearing daily things. Mm -hmm. um, I would drop kids off at school, go to a coffee shop, from eight till nine o'clock, which is when the library doors open. So mm. that hour I would clear everything out, clear calendar, and just in case I didn't get everything done in that hour, that's where the notebook came in so I could um, jot down anything that was pressing. That's awesome, and it sounds like you treat your time for writing with the utmost respect, <laughs> which I think is a real challenge for a lot of writers. Yes. Um, and you know, do you ever what do you call it? Like when people say, oh, can we meet at this time or can you do this? Do you have a specific name or do you say I'm working or do you see, what do you do with yeah. that? It took me a long time to say I'm a writer and I'm an author, um, but that's what I do now. I'm writing that day so I can't meet. I'm also, my, my strongest writing seasons are fall through spring and summer gets a little hairy. So I know if Tuesday's the best beach day, you won't find me at the library. <laughs> so I, I acknowledge there's an ebb and a flow too, but generally if I'm in the writing season of fall, winter, spring, I will, I, I protect that Tuesday morning. Good, and mm -hmm. so obviously we're in the age of COVID right now, yes. hence our beautiful face masks. <laughs> um, so I really would love to hear how did, because you said you went to the library, uh, how did that, the fact that the library wasn't even open for so right. long and you know cafes weren't open even or you couldn't sit in them uh how did covid and only not that we want to talk about <laughs> covid but how did that change your schedule and because i think for a lot of artists and writers and creative people uh, sometimes they said it was a great time for creativity others yeah. like myself uh it kind of put the kibosh on it so maybe talk a little bit about how you dealt with that yeah, I would say it affected two things. It affected the schedule, obviously, because I couldn't go to my place. And it also affected creativity. So schedule-wise, I tried to, once we got settled a bit, um, find little nooks in my house. Um, you know, the basement, a closet. <laughs> <laughs> Just looking for somewhere where I could find um, a place with very few distractions. I'm very visual um, with, uh, 
with all the senses. I, I explore the world through my senses, and that's where I get my writing. So that's one of the reasons I go to the library, because there are no distractions there. Um, and having said that, my writing relies on experiencing the world, and that's where I get ideas. So a lot of that felt very tamped down. Mm. Um, so what I did do, I focused a lot on sensory in my house, you know, turning to cooking and maybe writing a 600 word essay on how to make salad dressing, you know, going through the very uh, sensory oriented process of that and talking about maybe memories associated with it. So initially it was very kind of deer in the headlight, what am I going mm. to do? Um, but I found moments of inspiration along the way. And so when you, you have such a ritual at the library, mm -hmm. did you recreate that at home or you, were you just sort of like, whatever I can get down, I'll get down? Or did you still try to sort of put yourself in that mindset? I tried to do time and day and place as much as I could. Um, I gave myself a little break because sometimes it was just so different. Mm. I didn't, I have a website where I have hundreds of essays that I've published over the last 10 years. Um, so there aren't as many essays in those months. Mm. I, I strive to write a, an essay a week during fall to spring, um, and that wasn't happening as much during COVID, but I realize that. And I think as part of being a writer, um, I know there's an ebb and flow to my writing. And once I accepted that the same thing was happening in that strange little period we were in, um, I, I became creative again. Oh, good. And so I guess it's, I, I'd love to touch on, I mean, you unfortunately dealt with too much reality during COVID, yeah. <laughs> but you're a nonfiction writer and yes. you mostly deal in essays. And mm -hmm. uh, so we're always curious to know how did, you know, Cornfields to Codfish is finished product now, mm -hmm. but when did you decide, you know, oh, I have some essays, I want to put them together mm -hmm. or... What was that process and you know from going from one essay to a whole book of essays? Yeah, um, I've been writing and putting essays out on my website for a very long time and over the years readers would say hey you should put something together you know and and um, finally when my kids were a bit older and I could put more time toward writing I opened up a Thursday morning to look at what are the possibilities what do I have here and so I started looking at the essays I had, and, and many of them that people really were drawn to, the readers, were about place. And um, so that's where I came up with Cornfields to Codfish. I grew up in Iowa and moved, I've been in Massachusetts since uh, 2005. And a lot of my writing, I would see, would be juxtaposing different elements of those places together. Okay. So out of what I had written, that's what I drew on. Um, essays about place between those two places. Right. And so do you, what is your process? Are you a journaler? Are you pulling things from a journal? Or do you just sort of come up, like what's, what gets you to write an essay? Is there a process for that? Or is it just you go with whatever hits you? Um, there's a, a term called a pantser or a planner in writing. And I am a pantser. Mm -hmm. I don't make a plan. I, I feel like if I have the time carved out to write on a Tuesday morning, if I can get to that place, something will happen. Mm. So um, I, I really rely on, um, like I said before, the senses to, to guide me to what I might be writing on. And I, I, don't, I like to write about juxta juxtaposition of cultures and peoples and places, but I've also written about things like a can of beans. Or, so it's very hard to pigeonhole me into what my topic of essays are because it, it really is whatever strikes me that day when I sit down. Right. And I know because I've read your essays, there's definitely a sense of place. There's a lot of sense of sensory items in there, and uh, but also a very homey mm -hmm. feeling. So these aren't essays. You know, there's all different types of essays. These are not essays that are necessarily called to action or mm -hmm. that are filled with rage or filled right. with, uh, I won't say filled with humor, but you do have this very easy humor about your writing. Mm -hmm. Do you want to talk a little bit about how you came upon the style that you write? Did it just, you know, evolve or yeah. how, did, how did that happen? Um, I think there are topics that I wait for things to come together. And 
I feel if I have a story about something simple like cooking, somebody else is going to maybe relate to the same thing. I'm very much a believer that I'm not the first and I won't be the last. And I think that's what readers feel in my writing. Um, if there's one adjective people use often, it's relatable. Mm. Um, so, you know, I might send, I, I publish my essays weekly and sometimes I might hear from a 90 year old reader about how wonderful this was and that I hadn't heard from in a long time. And then again, I might hear from a, a younger reader that I hadn't f heard from for a long time. So I think we have, as humans, relatable experiences. Mm -hmm. And I look at slice of life pieces of our world to bring that together. Right. And you talked about, uh, which I think is interesting and important for writers, especially writers that think they want to publish something, uh, mm -hmm. a collection of anything, or a book of some sort, is you didn't start thinking, I want to publish a book, no. and then start writing, and then create your website. You more organically started putting your writing out there because you wanted to write mm -hmm. and connect, and then it evolved. So do you want to talk yeah. a little bit about sort of, I won't call it building your platform, but yeah. uh, kind of more of a genuine evolution mm -hmm. to the end product versus almost starting with the goal is the end product and then yes. working backwards. Yes. So I started writing consistently in 2009 when I was diagnosed with breast cancer and I'm, I'm fine. I made it through treatment. All, all is good now. Um, but I, we are here with no family around us. So I started writing essentially letters to people, to family in Iowa, to family in England to let us know what, what was happening in life. Mm. Um, and then after that, about six months into that, they started being less um, this is what we're doing today, and more reflective. And that's really when I started writing essays. Was and what when, does that mean when you say more reflective? Um, if, if you wait for time to pass, I think of journaling as a time when you maybe lay out a lot of bare feelings and emotions. And I don't journal. I just jump in and write essays. Um, but... Sometimes if you wait for something to pass, it, it, your perspective almost becomes a third person. I'm writing in first person, but I can look back with the distance and a knowledge and a different perspective than if I'm writing in the heat of a moment. Mm. So I rely on, on that. And that's really interesting because there are so many memoirs and books of people yeah. that it started out as letters. Um, mm -hmm. And so do you want to talk a little bit about how, when was the turning point when you said, I'm turning... Yeah. These, I want to collect these into, I mean, I know you said people were encouraging you, but when mm -hmm. did you decide, yes, I want to do that? Um, I think it was, again, when life said it was okay, when I had more time. Mm. And also when I could confirm, it took me a long time to figure out what to collect because I do write about such diverse topics. So when I went back, um, I do a mailing every week and I can see statistics and see what people maybe read three or four times. Mm -hmm. So I actually relied on statistics to kind of guide me and you know, who was, who was opening the story about cornfields five times? Right. Who was opening the story about making swordfish and capers five times? Mm -hmm. And then through that, almost like a statistical analysis, I kind of saw the thread of, you know, people are interested about place. They're interested about stories about place um, and how other people live. Hmm. And so what, maybe walk us through for people that are like, what does she mean, statistical analysis? Yeah. <laughs> uh, how does one go about doing that? What yeah. did that involve? And like, is there a specific uh, program you use or, or whatever? Yeah, I use, um, I've used a couple different email services over the years. And with those email services, I can look at the stats, literally how many people have opened something, mm -hmm. um, if they've opened it multiple times, if they've moved into my website and had a look around. So it's a service provided with the newsletter. It's, it's nothing I went out and tracked. It was very lovely laid out for me so I could kind of find the, the uh, patterns. Okay. And so you're writing essays. Uh, wh how did you get people to become your part of your mailing list? I mean, I know sometimes people are like, oh, I'd love to do that, but 
how do yeah. I get people to actually read these things? Mm -hmm. I uh, initially it was grassroots, so to speak, because I was writing to people I knew mm -hmm. with, through those letters. And then once I became um, more comfortable, I got used to saying, you know, if someone asked what I did, oh, I'm a writer. If you give me your email address, I'll send you, you know, my weekly essays to have a look at. Mm. So I had a base, and then I just have slowly added onto it. All right, mm -hmm. and so. Here we are with a book. Uh, you want to talk a little bit about what it's like, you're a self-published author. Yes. Uh, maybe a little bit about what you thought it would be like and if mm -hmm. there's anything that actually reality didn't live up to or exceeded. Yeah. Uh, maybe a little bit about that whole experience. Okay, I did a lot of research on how to publish and where I was, I wanted to be published. I wanted to be published quickly. So I chose, rather than finding the people and the support of a publishing house, I decided to do it on my own. And I knew with the followers, I had have about 300 people that I send to weekly. So I thought if I self-published, I was pretty confident with people following me that long that I would be able to sell some books mm. out of the, you know, right away. Um, yeah, so that's where it it started, I, I looked for, um, I, I also wanted to have control and I wanted to have human contact. So if in the self-publishing houses I looked at, if people didn't return my call or weren't, you know, as attentive, I, I went on until I found someone where I could talk to a real person mm -hmm. that supported what I was doing. That still exists. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so you get the books in your hand. What's that feeling and what happens next? Yeah, that was pretty exciting. Just, uh, um, I, they were delivered in November of 2019 to my house. And with self-publishing, my book is still available through warehouses. So independent bookstores can order, any independent bookstore can order it for their clientele. And I also have some that I can sell on my own. So what I did, um, I tapped into a local festival around the holidays, and that was my book launch locally, so to speak. Mm. And then I went to Iowa, and um, there's a gift store there was that graciously invited me to have a book signing right around the holidays. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, was, that was phenomenal. That was where I reconnected with a lot of friends my fourth grade English teacher came wow. <laughs> and purchased a book from me. And so, um, did she mark it up? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Wow. So I had a really good, strong launch. And I think the difference now is I, I have a very warm audience who have purchased my book. So the tough part about self publishing is now it's on me to go out and create new audiences. Mm -hmm. um, I am the marketer. I am the person to distribute. Right. So that's that's the next stage. And so, any plans on how you would go about doing that, especially for other uh, authors that they've published a book and they are also now okay. The excitement yeah. has waned of the the first push, and now what do you do? Like, how do you how oh, do you organize yourself? That and is so the question right now. <laughs> um, it, so. It, my launch came right before the pandemic closed everything down. So mm. I've had lots of time to think about this. <laughs> but I think making personal connections is strong for me. Um, and I'm also looking at book signings at um, independent bookstores and both here and in the Midwest. I would like to do that. Um, yeah, so it's still, it's a work in process. Mm -hmm. And uh, one thing I do want to ask you about is having a pen name. Yes. Uh, I always think that's intriguing, and I just want to know what's the realities of that? Is it confusing? Do you forget no. who you are, or how does yes. that work? It's very confusing. Um, because I'm a nonfiction writer, mm -hmm. I write a lot about my life. And I, at the time um, when I was writing a lot, I didn't feel comfortable sharing what I was writing mm -hmm. as the mom, the, you know, the sister, the whoever. So uh, finally I thought, well, people do this. Mm -hmm. So 
so I, I write under a different name. And um, it's given me a lot of freedom, but it's also strange because people don't realize I am two people, <laughs> which is a little confusing. But um, right. yeah, I'm, I'm glad I made the, the decision, and it was for privacy. And so how do, have you had people that say, you put me in this essay, <laughs> you know, yeah. uh, I look better than I thought, or I look worse, you know, have yeah. you ever had anybody, you know, where you do deal in nonfiction, uh, mm -hmm. has that ever been a problem, or have you reconnected because of it, or any of that? Yeah, there's a lot of writing around using truthful, hardcore, you know, stories where you might alienate someone, and that's not the goal of my writing. Mm. Um, if ever I thought I was in doubt of something, I might take it out. Or I would send, send it to the person and say, hey, I'm considering putting this in my book. Are you okay with it? So I'm conscious of that. I, I write for enjoyment. I love writing. And I want people to enjoy my reading. And I don't feel like I want to um, put anyone at odds with what I've written. Mm. Yes. So I'm and careful. So what's the difference between doing an event in Iowa and doing an event in Massachusetts? Any difference? Or do you have to approach it differently? That's a good question. Um, in Massachusetts, because I'm a transplant, I, I don't know as many people. And in Iowa, I grew up in the, I went K through 12 in the same school. Um, my brothers went to the same school. My sister, it's very you, they're building blocks of relationships that have been there for generations. So I had people that I hadn't seen in years and years and years come out to support me. And that was just so lovely, so lovely. After not having lived there for, um, gosh, 30 years. Right. So, yeah, it was a very homey feeling. It was lovely. And so now that you feel like you can call yourself an author, published mm -hmm. author. Uh, what's it feel like now writing? Do you feel like you're working towards another project or are you still, mm -hmm. you know, what's, what's the feeling right now? Yeah, um, one of the reasons I didn't go for a, a publisher, so to speak, I have written my essays and put them in my own. I, saw, I call my website my storage vault where I just put my essays. So there, are, like I said, there are hundreds there. And um, now I want to start sending my writing out to journals or different organizations for publication. Mm. Um, over the years, my goal was to, on Tuesday, to write it and on Wednesday morning to send it. And with that goal, I consistently wrote and I wow. consistently sent, even if it wasn't very good, <laughs> I still sent it. So now I want to try to be published as an author in journals and other areas. Wow, and I think that's so important is having, even though it's of your own design, having a deadline, having yes. being held responsible for your writing. Yes. Uh, was that something you always did or was that something you knew you needed to do? I, I did a lot of reading um, about the creative process and um, there was a book by Seth Godin and he, he talked about shipping your work. And he just said, there's so much creativity in this world. And people are hemming and hawing, and I'm not good enough. I'm not there yet. And his, his mantra is, ship it. <laughs> ship it. So that became my mantra weekly, mm. was send something, right. even if it's something that's going to. And there's some things that I would push send and think, boy, this is just, whew. And, uh, and I might get three or four people who would come back and say, Yes, I get this. So um, ship it. Right. That's what I do. And is that the, I know you said you brought a book that was a book that you love. Oh, so <clears throat> when I go to the library, I take my computer. I only write on my computer. I take my notebook. And I also take inspiration. Um, there was a time when I didn't know what I was doing, what I was writing, because I knew I wasn't a short story writer because mm. I don't write fiction. Um, I would say maybe seven years ago, I just stopped writing and thought, what am I doing? I don't really know what I'm doing. And then I went back and um, looked at some of the writing I liked in college. And eventually I found, I discovered that I'm an essayist. <laughs> and this is a book by Philip Lope. It's called To Show and to Tell. Mm -hmm. And when I read it, it felt like I was reading 
uh, something that an uncle had written that it, it was just so much my writing. So I, I keep this with me for inspiration. If there's a day when I think, what am I doing? I can mm -hmm. go, it's dog-eared, it's underlined, it's highlighted, and it inspires me. Right, and I <coughs> feel like that's a great example of, uh, I think a lot of times writers or creators feel like they have to constantly be writing or they're not yeah. doing what they should be doing in that time, but it sounds like you're telling them it's okay if there's a blank space and you're not yeah. writing. Uh, maybe you're taking other things in. And mm -hmm. So do you find yourself, do you have a rhythm where you're flat out writing or do you find that there's times you have to? Yeah, if I feel I'm <clears throat> struggling about what is it, where am I going with this, I do go back. Not Oftentimes with the writing time, I leave it as it is, but if I want to pick up um, something to read in an afternoon or something, I might go back to this. Hmm. Um, I read... <clears throat> Excuse me. I read a lot of fiction for enjoyment, and I read a lot of um, several things writing about writing. Mm. So I don't necessarily write read a lot of nonfiction, so to speak, but I read a lot of how to, how I did this, right, to get ideas. And speaking of nonfiction, do people say, mm. you know, oh, hey, what's that book you wrote? And then when they hear it's nonfiction, does, is there ever a change, like change? Yeah. Like, oh, it's not, you know, what's the reaction to, because I haven't spoken to a lot of authors who write right. nonfiction, let alone essays. Are they surprised by that or are they turned off or turned on by that? Yeah, it's a struggle in how I market what I do because I am an essayist. Mm. But my readers say, I love that story. I really love that story. Or that story spoke to me or the story, story, story. Mm. So um, while I'm a nonfiction writer, I'm also a storyteller. Mm, and I think that's important because yeah. that is what people are doing, whether it's fiction or nonfiction, it's passing stories on, mm -hmm. right? Whether right. it's writing or art or, yeah. you know, at the end of the day, you're trying to get across yes. a story. Yes. And well, I think that came, came across most, my, I have, uh, she was eight at the time when I published this. Yeah. And she loved reading the essays because so much of it is about growing up in Iowa and family. And she was fascinated by it. So, Well, you're a fascinating writer. <laughs> <laughs> um, so we're running out of time, but I okay. always like to ask, is there anything that you want to pass on to writers, whether they're struggling, whether they've established themselves, young, old, uh, maybe some gleans of wisdom yeah. that you've picked up along the way that you wish you knew or mm. would like to pass on to our viewers? Yeah, I think when a person says, I want to write, um, the biggest gift you can give to yourself is the time to do it. And to, I, I'm very much in a habit of giving myself time. But if you want to write, I think that's the first step is making the time, whether mm -hmm. I take three hours to do it. Maybe you have an hour, maybe you have a half hour, maybe you have 15 minutes in the car. But if you can create a space for you to write, I think that's a good first step. Nice, and then guard it with your life. Yes. <laughs> Which it sounds like you do a great job of. Well, thank you, Linda, and uh, good luck with Cornfields to Codfish. It's a wonderful sort of heartwarming group of essays for a time when you need a nice yeah. cup of soup and <laughs> some nice stories for a change. So thanks for coming in with us. And if you would like to be part of the journey of a story and you have a published piece of writing, uh, feel free to contact me at www.theroomtowrite.org. Thanks Thank again. You.